Hi, welcome to Parents League Presents. I'm Gina Mallon, Executive Director of the Parents League of New York, and I'm here today with Cal Cheney. Um, Cal is a nationally recognized expert in the field of college financing and financial aid, and the author of the Princeton Review Guidebook, Paying for College Without Going Broke. He is the founder and president of Campus Consultants, Inc., a Manhattan-based financial advisory firm, and has appeared on all the major television networks, including ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox, NBC, a guest on NPR, and now a guest for the Parents League. So I wanna thank Cal so much for being here today, and also to thank him for his presentation on February 12th for the Parents League. So my first question is, is financial aid available? And what are the types of financial aid available at colleges? Okay, there are two types of aid available. Because of course the best way to pay for college is to have someone else pay for you, or at least part of it. So the two major types of aid is are the merit-based funding and then the need-based aid. Mm -hmm. So the merit-based funding, what would be traditionally known as a scholarship that is awarded for students for academic ability, athletic prowess, creative performing art talent, or for students who spe uh, possess special characteristics mm -hmm. that are desirable to the university. So basically the colleges are giving those money to woo certain students to attend their institution to improve their profile or to meet other institutional purposes. The other type of aid is the need-based money, and need should not be equated with needy. There are families sometimes with incomes over $200,000 at private colleges who do qualify for need-based assistance, which is basically based on the relationship between two components, the cost of attendance of the school. That's the tuition and fees, the room board, books, transportation, personal expenses, and then the expected family contribution, which is the financial aid term for the amount of money each year that's calculated by the government and the colleges to determine what you can be expected to pay towards school. And if the cost is greater than the family contribution, then you've demonstrated need and are eligible for need-based aid that can come in the form of student loans and work study, the self-help portion, but more important to families, the gift aid, the grants, what they would traditionally be called, but they could also be scholarships based on need as well. Um, we always get this question when parents are applying for financial aid at independent school level. Is there an income cutoff? There is no income cutoff per se. There may be cutoffs for some programs. For example, um, for the Excelsior Scholarship or the Enhanced Tuition Award that's offered by New York State for certain schools within the state of New York. That has a specific income cutoff number based on the adjusted gross income. New York State TAP Grants, um, which is another uh, program based on need, funded by the New York State Higher Education Services Corporation, administered by them. Um, that program also has a income cutoff based on New York State net taxable income. But the federal programs and the institutional aid is based on a much more complex formula that puts the IRS tax code looks like child's play. <laughs> because they're looking not only at income that would go on your tax return, but assets as well. Certain assets are assessed, others aren't. Certain types of income may be excluded in one formula, but not in another. So it depends on a lot of factors. And then there's also the issue of um, what's the marital status of the parents? What's the living arrangements of the parents? Because some schools will want to look at both biological adopted parents when they award their own money, but other schools may only want to look at one parent's information if the biological adopted parents are divorced, separated, or were never married. Okay, so just to be clear, for merit-based scholarships, um, you do not have to pay back, it's not a loan. Right, grants and scholarships, those two key components are considered gift aid. That is generally there's no strings attached mm -hmm. to pay it back. There are some exceptions though, for example, the New York State Excelsior Scholarship. If you don't live and work in the state of New York, if you're working, mm -hmm. or at least live in New York, for one year, for every year you get that scholarship, that scholarship will become an interest-free loan that will need to be repaid. 
but scholarships and grants that are offered by the university. Mm -hmm. The Pell Grant, the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, those two federal grants, the New York State TAP Grant, um, the New Jersey TAG Grant, those are generally gift aid. You receive those funds, they're a direct credit against the bill owed to the school, and those don't have to be paid back. Okay. So you talked about um, at the Parents League presentation about the myths of need-based financial aid. Can you, can you um, tell the audience a little bit about those myths? So there are many myths out there about aid, which is why it makes sense for many families to make sure they have accurate and up-to-date information. A lot of information out there is outdated or erroneous. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, you're best off just forgetting everything you've heard from your friends and well-intentioned family members. Um, because it may not be correct. But there are a number of myths. For example, um, that there is an income cutoff. There isn't per se for the aid. That um, the sooner you apply for aid, the more money you'll get. Very few schools now award money on a first come, first serve basis. Um, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, they don't. There may be some states that do that. But the most colleges themselves, it doesn't work that way. They're really rationing out the money and they're gonna have a priority filing deadline. Another myth is that if you own your own home, you won't get any aid. And for federal aid, um, New York State aid, state aid from New Jersey, Connecticut, and many schools, they don't look at the home at all. It's a totally sheltered asset. Wow. And those schools that do ask about it in some cases will cap the value at a percentage of the income and subtract the debt, or they'll cap the equity. Many schools, they cap the equity at two times the income. Or they may look at the home and say, if your income is below this amount, we won't look at it at all. If it's above this amount, we'll look at it somewhat. Or they might even say with the home that if you bought it many years ago for next to nothing, we're not going to assess that at all versus if you bought it recently and paid a large amount of money for the property, they're going to look at it differently. So the home, that's another wild card. The other myth is that parents have to be working to get aid, mm -hmm. and that's not true at all either. They're gonna look at income, if there are benefits coming into the household, or if there's untaxed income, or income other than income from work, they're gonna look at that, but it's not a requirement that the parents be working to get aid. The other myth that's out there somewhat is that the aid office and the school is more like a charity, and they're gonna be helping you get the most aid. That doesn't mean the people in the school are bad, but the institutional constraints are such because the demand for ADC is supply that they're not going to be showing you necessarily how to present your case to best advantage so that you'll qualify for the most aid. And then the last myth would be that the amount of aid you get is the same, regardless of say whether you're looking down Lexington Avenue at Hunter College or whether you're looking at Harvard, you get the same amount of money in part the amount of aid you get is a function of the cost of the school, so you shouldn't necessarily rule out any school as being too expensive. Do parents have to apply every year for aid? Just like many questions, the answer is it depends. It depends. If you're getting merit money mm -hmm. from the school, there may be nothing further that has to be done to get that money renewed, although parents should be very careful and students as well to see, is there a minimum grade point average that must be maintained in order to continue mm -hmm. to get the funding every year? Are there other requirements that need to be met to assure that you get that funding? And if you're a prospective student in 12th grade looking at the schools, that's one thing to look at. If you do get a scholarship, what are the strings attached? How high is that GPA you have to have? If it's like 2.8, 2.5, that's not so hard to do. But if it's 3.5, mm -hmm. that's almost like bait and switch in many cases. It's so high mm -hmm. that many students who get that the first year aren't going to continue to get it in subsequent years because the uh, hurdle is so high to continue to get that funding. For the need-based aid, in most cases, you do have to apply for aid each year. For federal aid, you do. For state aid, you do. For some schools with their institutional money, Boston University, for example, is they have a special program whereby the aid you get the first year, the grant that you get, that stays the same, and the only reason you need to reapply for aid is if you want to be considered for federal aid every year, or a student loan work study, but otherwise you don't have to apply. But in most cases you do, but that's very important to read the fine print because the deadlines every year may change. And the deadlines for current students who are gonna reapply for aid could very well be different than the deadlines for the prospective students. Mm -hmm. 
So you mentioned deadlines, but you said you just have to be aware of the deadlines, but you don't have to be the first one to apply. Right, and that would be that you don't get rewarded necessarily for being early, Okay. but um, the real problems could be at some schools if you don't meet the deadlines. Right. So getting it in sooner and rushing to have it be the first person to get the form in isn't necessarily going to help you unless you're looking at a school, and there are a few of them, that award money on a first come, first serve basis. But there are very few schools that do that anymore because it's not a... Um, efficient way for the schools to leverage their financial aid. Okay. What about uh, for a student that's applying for early decision? Um, do those deadlines correspond with the financial deadlines and do they receive their package after that EG notification? Okay, that's a good point for early decision and that's the admission process whereby students apply early in the senior year and if they're accepted they're generally bound to attend the school. Mm -hmm. There's also early action, which is another early review program where if you hear early, you are accepted, you can still apply to other schools and you don't have to decide till the universal reply date of May 1st whether you're coming or not. And then there's regular decision where you have till May 1st and you may hear early, you may not hear early, some schools do it on a rolling basis. But they're gonna be different filing requirements and deadlines based on the admission status and based on the school's policy. Obviously for early decision, they have to be able to give you an aid package for you to be able to commit to come to the school. So those deadlines might be as early as November 1. They might be the same deadline as the admission deadline for the school, but they may be a little bit later. It varies from school to school. Early action, that's a whole different kettle of fish because for some schools early action, they want you to apply early for the aid so they could maybe give you a package early and you might decide mm -hmm. that's where I wanna go and game over. Other schools though for early action may decide we don't do anything early with aid. Your deadlines are the same as if you are applying regular decision and you have some time. So you might hear if you're accepted first before you have to apply even for aid at that school. So again, it makes sense to look at the individual college's financial aid websites, not the admissions website, not the general guidebooks like, you know, the Pearson Guide or the Kaplan Guide because the information in there may not be the correct information. Many schools, they just post and decide what they want. For example, this year Yale, for regular decision students, didn't post till sometime in January that their deadline was March 1st, that that's what it was gonna be. There was still it was to be determined so you have to keep looking at that mm -hmm. look online mm -hmm. um, and be on top of the process okay. so speaking of early how early should families start thinking about preparing for college tuition and financing how early is too early um, I always joke and say <laughs> it's not too early to start nine months before yeah. the baby is born <laughs> Um, because it is such a high cost mm -hmm. and that's an important point to understand is if your child is young in terms of what vehicles you're going to use for your college nest egg because those funds can be treated different ways in the aid formula so that's very important if you're going the need-based aid route to know what categories of assets are a problem because they're assessed very heavily and which ones are not assessed very much at all for example 529 plans those accounts, those are tax advantage plans that most states offer in which the funds are contributed on the after tax basis from a federal standpoint. The funds grow tax deferred. And if they're used for qualified education expenses, then those funds aren't subject to tax. Those generally, if the parent owns the plan, which in most cases that's who owns mm -hmm. the plan for the benefit of the child, the child itself doesn't have the plan, the parents own it for the benefit of the child. Those are considered parental assets those aren't assessed as heavily as if those same funds were put into a custodial account or a trust fund for the child is set up by a well-intentioned relative. So you need to be careful if you're eligible for the need-based money to have a shot for that of where those funds go because they could be assessed very heavily if they're put in the wrong places or not assessed very much at all. And do you advise families where to put those funds? 
We, we advise, advise some families, most of our clients that come to campus consultants are in what's called the crisis period. But because of the look back period now, as far back as January of the sophomore year of high school to determine eligibility for aid based on the income starting at that point, it's not too early in the ninth or 10th grade to mm -hmm. start. Mm -hmm. But for families who are much younger, and then we cover this in the book, how those different vehicles, Coverdells, 529s, et cetera, are gonna be treated. Of course, if you are um, just having a newborn or a very young child, the question always is, should I be putting money for child aside, set aside for their college, or should I be focusing on my retirement? And always, the point to understand, it's really paying for college is a retirement problem. Because you can always borrow money to pay for college, but you can't borrow for your retirement. So if your employer, for example, is gonna match your 401k, it would behoove you to put the money in there, that's somebody else giving you some extra money. If you're covered for your retirement, when your child is ready for college, you can be in a better position with your current income to spend more money that way. Another advantage of that though is two in the aid formulas is that retirement assets are generally 100% excluded from assessment in the aid formulas. So that's saving funds into accounts that aren't going to have any impact in most cases on your eligibility for aid. Well, thank you so much for um, all of your expertise and we can go on and on, but I um, encourage everyone to um, look for paying for college without going broke and they could reach you, Cal, where can everyone reach the, you? The, the best way is to call us Campus Consultants, 212-861-8806. We have a website, campusconsultants.com, but because situations, the answers, again, it depends, before someone wishes to use our service, it's generally that they speak to us first mm -hmm. so that we can get some idea what category they fit into based on the age of the child, uh, their education goals, etc. Great, thank you so much. And um, thank you for watching. Uh, visit us at parentsleague.org.